Good afternoon and welcome to another Veterans Forum program interview. Uh, this must be Navy week because it'll be the second or third fellow that we've had come forward from the Navy sharing his experiences with you as you know the program is. Today is the 20th of November 2009. Time is sure of passing, isn't it? What I will introduce, the young fellow right here, ask him his name, he'll introduce himself, and then we'll kind of wonder where he is from now back, how he came to be where he is now, okay? Sam, I welcome you. Well, and, ooh, you're still warm. I'd like you, yeah. if you will, give us your full name, spell your last name, branch of service, active duty dates. Oh, thank you, Bob. Uh, well, I'm Samuel Elder Barnes, that's B-A-R-N-E-S, and uh, I was on active duty uh, from um, 19, 52, October 1952 to February 1956. And uh, then subsequently uh, I uh, served in the um, Ready Reserve for uh, 18 more years. Oh, couldn't hold on a job, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, what was your rank at, at di discharge, if you will, when you retired? Well, What's I have it right behind me. I made uh, commander. Oh, so okay, I just want to make sure we got that in there. stripes. Oh. Okay, all right. Yeah, you know, uh, if I, I, you know, if I had stayed in, uh, it really, there was so much paperwork when you get on that level that it was just uh, became uh, really too much for me. I mean, okay. uh, you hated writing. I figured it was, t well, responsibility for, uh, you know, signing a lot of things that uh, you, you really weren't absolutely sure of, oh. you know, because oh. you didn't do it yourself, <laughs> oh. you know. That is a good caution. All right. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do is, as I said before the program started, uh, go back uh, to kind of build a history of uh, who you are, where you're from. For example, uh, where and when were you born? Mm -hmm. uh, how was family life growing up? Do you have any brothers and sisters, or even more to that point, uh, any of your family in any way in the services? And you take it from there. It's all your show, buddy. Well, thank you, Bob. Well, I was, uh, I was born in... Um, um, November 26, 1929. So I have a big date coming up on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, okay, I'm going to give you I'll the bird. Huh? So yeah, <laughs> right behind you, <laughs> or, or perhaps right along with you, anyway. But um, uh, I come from a family of uh, nine children. My father had nine children, and uh, my older. He was really half brother. John was a chief machinist mate uh, out in the uh, Pacific during World War II. Uh, but he passed away. I think he was 95 when he passed away uh, a couple of years ago. But he was a great guy. And um, but I. Uh, Where were you born? I was yeah. born in Taunton, Mass. Oh, okay. And uh, our hometown was Mansfield. Um, but I, I have a sort of in my genes to uh, to be uh, you know in in the Navy because uh, uh, I was uh, I was at sailing camp in Chatham, Cape Cod, from 1935 to 1941. It was called Camp Malabar, and we used to race on Stage Harbor. And uh, I can remember racing this little Cape Cod knockabout, uh, you know, when I was uh, just uh, some, somewhere between six and. 11 years old is a, is a regular type thing. But uh, I have a heritage of, um, see, my grandfather uh, was a, um, uh, came from uh, County Antrim in Belfast, uh, Ireland. Uh, and he, he was a painter and he did this uh, picture, yeah, I'll, uh, what I'll a, hold it up for watercolor you. of a sketch, which I found uh, this week, actually, I realized that I had it, but uh, it's been uh, in the family. Uh, you know, he's probably did that uh, eight, seven or eighty years ago. But um, I'm holding it. I loved him dearly. Uh, he uh, he was a great uh, friend of mine, and uh, uh, he was a great friend of my dad's too, because they were about the same age. Uh, my Ooh. father's first w uh, wife died in. Uh, 1915, after her um, her fourth uh, child was uh, David, uh, uh, was born in 1908, and uh, they discovered that he had uh, polio when he was eight years old, and uh, 
it, my and uh, dad's first wife uh, died of a broken heart. Uh, but um, it, uh, you know, it's, it, there's a, a lot of uh, history of uh, with my dad. Uh, um, he was uh, class of 1904 at Yale, and my grandfather was class of 1880. Uh, but when the Korean War broke out in um, uh, when they crossed the Yalu in uh, late June of uh, 1950, um, I was uh, helping Dad uh, in his campaign for governor uh, of Massachusetts. And as a matter of fact, right about that time, I, we flew into Pittsfield, and it's the first time I ever came to Pittsfield. And uh, uh, he went and spoke to a Republican uh, gathering, and I, I went and had a golf match uh, with a fellow I knew at Yale uh, who uh, got me in a match with Bobby Jones's son. And oh. it's a great experience, but I, I'll never forget the 14th hole looking out on Mount Greylock, and that was an impression that stood me in good stead later on down the years when I had a chance to work for General Electric uh, up here. Uh -huh. But. Um, Anyway, uh, it, junior year, uh, it, you know, I was so c wrapped up in the campaign and trying to help Dad, which he lost the nomination. He came in third in September of 1950. But um, I, uh, we had to take tests to pass a certain grade at, at Yale uh, to uh, stay out of the draft. and. Uh, to you know, stay out of the draft? Stay out of the draft. Oh, for an exempting? Yeah, you had to get a 70, I think. But I, you know, being seagoing type, have, having grown up, uh, you know, around the sea and also summering in Martha's Vineyard, uh, racing on sailboats in the late 40s, uh, in, uh, you know, regattas and ty that type thing. As a matter of fact, I met John Carradine, uh, who was this great character actor with mm -hmm. the long chin, oh, yeah. who was in the first movie that I ever remember seeing was Captain's Courageous in, in the late 30s. But I remember chatting with him at the Nantucket uh, Yacht Club, and uh, he had this sonorous voice, and uh, uh, he was just uh, so impressive that um, I thought, uh, you know, it was worth uh, mentioning. At, at, you, you did? Know, okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, but uh, Later in the, in the fall, uh, I got together with uh, nine classmates. So there were 10 of us from uh, Yale who decided that uh, we ought to try for the Reserve Officer Corps, which was called ROC, the ROC program. And uh, that was a sort of a, a late version of the ROTC. I mean, it, it, we would be starting late because ROTC would start in freshman year. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a way of... Um, uh, you know, um, getting a commission and uh, being an officer, uh, but I always thought that not not one of us made it until uh, our 50th reunion. I was sitting at a table, and one of my classmates was a fellow named Don Quinn. He says, "Sam," he says, "I was accepted for that program." <laughs> so was he the so only one? I, th as far <laughs> as I know, he's the <laughs> only one. I, uh, it was. You see, there was a great um, influx of people trying to get into this particular program. Uh, if, if people uh, had, uh, you know, uh, a seagoing background, uh, or you know, have to have know. the smarts too, though. We're, right, and uh, but I, th well, I don't know. Uh, I think everybody had the smarts. I think it was just that the question was that there were so many oh, that uh, okay. were applying for it. Um, so, um, so we, you know, I joined at the New Haven uh, Training Center, a Naval Training Center, and. Uh, Oh, this uh, is before winter. going in, though? I was a junior at Yale. Okay, you were still civilian. Yeah, okay, definitely. Right. And I was sort of like in the standby reserve, but I, about the spring of junior year, I applied for um, uh, Officer Candidate School. And, uh, well, actually, it was, it was more like in the senior year. I, I applied for uh, OCS because we got turned down for ROC, so. Uh, so when I graduated um, in June of um, 52, uh, well, I, the first thing that I had, I was preoccupied with was uh, 
going to the Republican National Convention where my dad was um, a great friend of uh, uh, Senator Robert Taft, who they call Mr. Republican. But uh, uh, Taft was, uh, came into the convention with, um, uh, I don't know, some 500 delegates, but uh, Tom Dewey and uh, Henry Cabot Lodge drafted good old uh, General Eisenhower, or Ike, as we all knew him by, and it was more or less over, but they had to have a, there were contested delegates from three states, and Dad actually debated, and it was the first time on television, uh, national television, so we were all very proud of him, even though uh, they lost the debate. It was so, a so-called Brown Amendment, and that was a test case uh, for, and when the Eisenhower uh, people won that debate, then the, the first roll call went stead, right along for Eisenhower. But then, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm waiting during the summer uh, for uh, uh, orders to uh, OCS, but uh, they weren't forthcoming. So I went to the Fargo building uh, in October. Uh, and that's on downtown Boston. And and you're right, right, uh, right across uh, from South Station there, and uh, we share that because oh, yeah. you uh, started. I, just, Fargo I did that so too. people would recognize some of the the places that's you know you're a native, if you will. Oh not, yeah, not from some place way out, like in Somerville or something like that. Right, and uh, <clears throat> so you know they said, "Well, uh, you can you can get right uh, get right aboard a train. Here's your orders." And you know, basically, uh, uh, so I was on my way to uh, Bainbridge, Maryland, and and I learned uh, I should have been aware then, but the Bainbridge was named after uh, the first destroyer built was the USS Bainbridge. In 1902. Wow, an old four stacker. Yeah. yeah. Well, it didn't even have four. I think it, it, it's a picture, picture of it. Yeah. Let's. Well, this I don't is going to be I kind of a show and tell because we want to make sure we get what you did I, I in don't know, here. I don't know if I can find. Well, uh, the, okay. It's in the destroyer book, which is down the way here. A little okay. Bit. Well, forget Might that. Might show it later. All right. But this was. Uh, that you? I would say uh, a seaman apprentice at the end of. Uh, my uh, stay at uh, Bainbridge, and uh, you know, those questions were, "What was your impression of Bainbridge?" Well, mm -hmm. I remember it was uh, wet, okay. and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and there were a lot of colds in the barracks. We had maybe a hundred, some somewhere between fifty and a hundred guys in this barracks, and the coughing was really something. And no disrespect meant to um, those who were over there, you know, serving because it, it was a bloodbath uh, against those. Uh, uh, Chinese that came over uh, with uh, North Koreans. Uh, okay, don't jump ahead too far. Red, can you get a, a shot of this? This is, uh, I'll call him Sam the Younger. Well, it, anyway, it's... There we uh, go, okay. Yeah, how do you look? Take a good look at yourself up there. <laughs> well, I was proud that I went right from the bottom okay, of the Navy. Okay, thank you. That that, uh, that I w it was a sort of a quasi uh, Mustang in the Navy, and uh, and I was also um, they, I, we had a a peppery little uh, chief petty officer as the uh, uh, CO of, CO or the head of the uh, company 282 I think it was called, but uh, a little profane uh, but uh, uh, but we got along famously and. Uh, he asked me to be the educational petty officer, and so I, I had uh, a satisfying time um, helping other boys, uh, young, uh, just young kids out of South Philadelphia and, and wherever, but up in the Northeast area uh, who needed help in their classes, so uh, I really was able to uh, help them uh, pass good. their tests. Good for you. And um, it, was, it was a good experience anyway. And, uh, but about the end of that, uh, we had the greatest thing that happened to me at boot camp was uh, they had a Christmas show, and uh, it was uh, it might have been called White Christmas, but anyway, it was conducted by Paul Hamill, who was uh, like a first-class petty officer in the Navy then, and um, uh, we the great song we I remember is singing White Christmas in, in parts, you know, as a First time, first choral singing I'd ever done, and uh, uh, I, I really, uh, you know, appreciated that very much. And coincidentally, about 25 or 30 years later, I, at South Congregational Church in Pittsfield, I was on the 
on a board that were screening uh, applicants for organist and choir director at, uh, at the uh, church. And the name Paul Hamill suddenly oh. hit me. And, uh, same guy? And, it was, and it's the same guy. And Paul ended up being uh, our choir director for five years in Pittsfield. And then he went on to uh, uh, St. Um, in Great Barrington, the Presbyterian Church. There's St. Uh, I can't think of the last name now, but it's a okay. fine Presbyterian yeah. Church. But he was, uh, he was a grand person and uh, a, a great organist and a great friend of my late wife, Joy, who, uh, who I met. Uh, I mean, the mother of my three children, and we met on Martha's Vineyard uh, my last day of uh, liberty, or my, my last day of leave from San Diego. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of the story yeah, because... Hopping and jumping around. Yeah. Okay, but go, go back. You can take your time. Uh, <coughs> well, anyway, uh, at OCS uh, in January, when I reported, uh, they uh, noticed that I'd been at... Uh, Bainbridge, so they said, well, you've got to be the mailman. <laughs> oh. So I immediately was, uh, you know, uh, a popular guy, because if you bring the mail, uh, you Everybody know, you're in the service. Oh, yeah. That's important. And uh, even though it was uh, Coddington Point, Newport, and it was, uh, it was a cold uh, deal there, but um, uh, it was uh, a great experience. And uh, I met, um, they had a, uh, you know, the great guys who were there. Uh, it was class 10, as a matter of fact, which was a very early class of OCS. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know how many classes they finally went up to, but maybe 100, I think they still have it. But, uh, so that was like uh, th three a year. So it would have been going into the, just the fourth year that OCS yeah. had been in existence. Uh, but uh, my bunk mate, we had double bunks, and uh, it was Bob Barbie from High Point, North Carolina. And uh, we got along very well. If, you know, he had the typical southern yeah, way, you know. Did he talk funny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he talked funny for a, a New Englander, like yeah. rock rib New Englander like me. But, uh, but we hit it off. And, uh, but all during active duty uh, later, uh, three, year, three plus years, uh, I never saw him until uh, my last day of active duty was in, in Pensacola, Florida in 1956. Uh, I was stayed in a BOQ there in, uh, in February, about February 20th or so. And I got up the next morning and was on the way to see my wife, Joy, uh, who, uh, my wife-to-be, Joy, uh, in uh, Winter Park, Florida. And uh, I pulled up to a traffic light on the, on the highway and stopped. And the car pulled up next to me, and I looked around, and I said, boy, that profile, that looks like Bob Barr B to me. And I was just about to roll, start to roll the window down. In those days, you didn't have a button you could push, yeah, you know. know. And uh, so um, the light changed, and he went off, and he was driving a Packard, and, and I had a little Ford convertible that was at, you know, about 70, 75. I was shaking to keep up with him. And I said, if he doesn't go into a gas station, I'll never know. And sure enough, uh, up the hill there, he pulled off, and, uh, and it was him. And I, my last, I just had my last day of active duty, and here I'd started in OCS with him, and, and so, I knew he was from the south, and I said, I figured he probably played golf. I said, have you got your golf clubs in your trunk? And he said, yeah. I said, well, let's go play the Tallahassee Country Club. Oh. So, so we went over there, and we had a great time playing together uh, uh, around uh, with great high uh, pine trees in that up, upstate Florida location. Uh, where the capital is, and had a nice steak dinner that night, and that, and that was the end. I have never seen him. I, tr I hope he's okay and still mm -hmm. around down there in North Carolina. But uh, anyway, it was uh, it was interesting bracketing of my naval experiences. But um, uh, from OCS, uh, I, I had uh, right about uh, early in OCS, I wanted to fly. And I wanted to be a naval uh, uh, pilot and uh, naval aviator. And uh, I, had, I had had a little accident when I graduated from Yale just three days before graduation in Chatham, of all places, where I did all that sailing when I was young. But we were at a great celebration party. And uh, I got in a little, uh, 
I had a little accident. I want to go into the details of it, but I lost several teeth, uh, my front teeth, uh, and it wasn't. Uh, it was an accident. It was a pure accident. Uh, but uh, it kept me out of the uh, naval aviation until uh, later on. It took about two years before I ever got orders for it, and I would pro I'll get to telling about how that, what happened then. Okay. But um, anyway, uh, uh, so uh, let's see, where are we now? Um, oh, I, I guess the Navy figured that uh, I had an interest you know, they realize that he's waiting for orders for to be a pilot, so they sent me to um, CIC officer school in Glenview Naval Air Station for six months of special training, and um, that was uh, really primarily to be an, an air controller by radar on uh, uh, on on ships or on a ship, and uh, it was a six months course, and uh, so. When I, in July, in the middle of that course, the shooting stopped in Korea. Uh, so uh, I, you know, um, completed that and, uh, but went and reported to a destroyer uh, in the Charlestown Navy Yard and it was in dry dock. And it was uh, November of 1953. And uh, the, the, the ship was, uh, uh, was a mess and unlivable, uninhabitable really. Uh, with cables everywhere and uh, is, is, uh, you know, up uh, no water and dry dock, and so we couldn't live aboard. So I, um, the officers had a, a chance to uh, live wherever they wanted to nearby, so they could be at for eight o'clock muster in the morning, uh, and uh, so or you you could stay at the BOQ. But I had a this half brother, who. Uh, contracted polio in uh, uh, 1915 and had lifeless little legs all his life, uh, was, was in a business in Boston and um, he had a home on Martha's Vineyard and he would uh, commute by a uh, small plane into Boston. Every uh, day or? No, just weekend. Uh, oh, okay. He'd have weekends on the vineyard and then he had, uh, he ran a real, um, uh, a, a, a terrific little business called uh, Red Cap Refresher, <laughs> uh, which was a, uh, was in a germicide uh, bottle, like a hobnail bottle, and uh, it turned out to be under his tutelage. It became number one air freshener in New England. But uh, he asked me if I wanted to stay with him in the university club. So uh, I, I said, "Great, Dave." Uh, and um, so it, everything was fine there for uh, several weeks. I'm being polite, but which U club? Harvard, Boston College, Boston University? It was it was a generic <coughs> university club. But oh, it was okay. Anybody who'd gone to university. Brand X. Yes, yeah. and uh, it was right below uh, Back Bay Station. Uh, but anyway, uh, I came home from the ship uh, one afternoon, and uh, the, the doorman was in uniform. He met me at the, and they said, "Oh, Mr. Barnes, have they found your brother yet?" And Oops. I said, what do you mean, have they found him? And they, he said, uh, you mean you don't know? And I said, no, I don't. I'm afraid to, you know, what he's going to say. And he said, well, he, he crashed in Boston Harbor this morning in a small plane from the vineyard. And uh, so I was, uh, you know, crushed. Uh, he, I, you know, loved him dearly. My, he's one of my father's nine children. And um, uh, he, with all the heavy braces he had on, he couldn't get out of that little plane. and the, Two guys that uh, were flying. Uh, he, uh, he was up in the co-pilot seat actually, and he bumped his head. But he went down, and the other two got out through the windows. Uh, but he went down, and they were 38 or 9 feet of water in, in Boston Harbor, and um, you know December uh, was um, uh, you know that was the end. Yeah. And I we I went out with the Coast Guard uh, the next day trying to find uh, where the plane was, but uh, they finally found it, and he's buried in. Uh, we had a funeral for him on Martha's Vineyard, so I had, uh, you know, uh, leave from the ship uh, for that. But um, yeah, it's great uh, memories of David. And um, uh, anyway, uh, from there, um, I got back to the ship, and it was about ready to go to uh, for refresher training of, you know, sort of a little. Uh, 
a coincidence there. His, his business had been refresh our, you know, oh, okay. and this uh, ship right. was ship was every ship out of dry dock goes to refresh our training. So we were on the we had to go down to uh, Gitmo, uh, Guantanamo Bay, which is much in the news with all you know the things that's gone on with the terrorists yeah. and everything. But um, we had a, a brief time in uh, uh, in Newport, and we had a couple of. Uh, Operations, which uh, you know, trying to go back, uh, what was it 50, uh, uh, 55? Let's see, this was 1954, uh, uh, anyway, early 54, back. 55 years ago. Uh, but I remember we did have night air ops one night before we started for Gitmo out of Newport, and uh, I can remember going up on the bridge at night and uh, way, way off. Uh, out in the North Atlantic, I mean, you know, not not right by the coast, but uh, you know, maybe 50 to 100 miles out. But it was with the USS Franklin, which was a small uh, carrier, and they were doing uh, the uh, pilots were doing touchdowns, touch and, take and goes, off, touch yeah. and goes, and uh, that was pretty impressive to me uh, that these how the you know this uh, intrepid guys. Now, that reminds me of another story, which I'll hope, hopefully time to tell later. Uh, but um, uh, I, I, I know you've, I've got to, we've got to move right along because yes, there's sir. so much to cover. <laughs> but we did get on to get Mo, uh, Guantanamo, and uh, it was, um, uh, you know, it was a great experience because uh, we became a team down there. We did daily ops, and it was... Uh, uh, a great uh, place because the weather was ideal and uh, it had changed when we got off Cape Hat got through Cape Hatteras uh, you know you can you get into the good weather and it just got better and better and um, so uh, so we we came, became a team and I was a assistant CIC officer but we I just started doing some air controlling I felt good because I was a specialist on board and uh, because of all the training I'd received in, in Glenview, and uh, I, you know that Glenview experience was had been something because the first day I went in this black room and there were nothing but radar scopes and with a pilot at each guy and a, with a student, and uh, anyway, uh, it was it was great training, and I became very good. I it was sort of I almost became intuitive. I mean, we didn't have a computer; it was a, uh, a PPI scope, a radar with a you know the the strobe going round and round, and Changing we would blip, we would blip. paint get a blip every uh, uh, hundred and eight every three hundred sixty degrees. You you get an echo from the plane, and you just had to mark it with a grease pencil, and that's how we followed the tracks. And you made the intercepts by uh, you know you had a bogey coming in. We called a hostile uh, aircraft. Uh, of course, then it was training, but anything that wasn't identified, which was. Uh, we, we used to call it identification friend or foe. If you couldn't find uh, your friend, if you couldn't find your pilot that you were controlling, you could ask him to squawk parrot, and that meant put on your IFF, IFF yeah. gear. And you got so I got a printout right over the, uh, and if the I didn't, no, I wasn't sure where the pip was, but I where I saw that little bar, uh, that <coughs> that was my my aircraft. So. Anyway, the bogey uh, obviously uh, didn't have, weren't, weren't able to squawk anything. But uh, we, we came back from, uh, as a team, I, we had a couple of great experiences uh, on, on Liberty. We went uh, into Santiago de Cuba, uh, you know, which was just uh, e uh, west of uh, Guantanamo. And that's where the Spanish fleet was bottled up in the War of 1898. And we actually could still, we had to maneuver a little bit around because the wrecks, you know, were still down still there. In the water? It was, yeah, and the harbor was quite small. It was like a long track in there, but there was a great little city up at the end. And, and at night, we, we all went to a great restaurant up in the hill, and you see the lights below, and it was a marvelous uh, experience. Uh, but um, we had other training like firing, uh, shore bombardment firing at Culebra, which they, I think they've shut down that island. Yeah, they had a now. lot of contest about the, that. Right, yeah. right, right. And uh, so if there were people living there, and you know, I didn't know that there were people living there then, but I, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we had, uh, you had some liberty in Kingston, Jamaica too, which was um, 
a, a great experience. But uh, we finally got back, and we, then we were on our way to the Med. And uh, looking back, the only thing I can remember about the Mediterranean duty, or the crossing of the Atlantic, was seeing Gibraltar, <laughs> that rock of Gibraltar up here. Uh, that, uh, I'm sure we had night air ops, because I have a story to tell when we came back. But in the Mediterranean, we were there for some between six and seven months. And uh, just going in any one particular port, or did you just hit all we, the stuff around? We the went. Equipment? We went all the way around. Uh, we started in Tangier, was the first port we went into, and then we went into Algiers, uh, Algeria, and I'll never forget going through the Casbah. I mean, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, you know, you felt so bad for the poor people that lived there. I mean, in, in squalor, or squalor, and um, it. You know, you sort of almost had to hold your nose going through there, and it was long steps going down. But um, but the we were. It was a uh, the American fleet in the Mediterranean was really showing the colors because it was still the Cold War. It was a year after the shooting stopped, but this was the summer of '54 and. Uh, it was important to make these appearances, and so we we uh, we went to the boot in uh, Toronto, uh, uh, Italy, which is the boot of Italy, and uh, we we went into uh, Cannes in, in France, um, and um, that was that was a great experience for me uh, because. Um, they had a golf tournament at, uh, and I was one of my problems when I was young was that I had a, a great obsession with golf. But anyway, uh, I had a very good round in this con country club. Uh, it was a Navy tourney. And we were sitting in this little patio afterwards, and uh, a good friend of mine, um, uh, Ray Arnold, uh, who I'm going to talk about later, but he was an air controller on our sister ship. And he said, gee, Sam, I think you might have won this thing. You had an even 70. And I said, I bet one of the pilots off that carrier broke 70 because I knew it wasn't that tough, of course. And sure enough, the uh, pilot did have a 68, so I was runner-up. But, uh, but it, you know, I, didn't, I don't want to um, uh, make it seem like it's a, you know, a luxury cruise that we had because there were a no, lot the of... taxpayers uh, are watching this, you yeah, be careful. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of tough operations going on. And, uh, uh, but I, there were some places that, uh, that we went into showing the colors, showing the flag of the American flag and one of the places was fantastic to go into was the Grand Canal in Venice and then we also anchored off uh, the island of Rhodes where the Colossus of Rhodes was it was one of the seven wonders of the world mm -hmm. year uh, centuries ago but the great statue of the Colossus uh, this uh, male figure which is hundreds of feet hundred feet high I guess had collapsed long ago so but the harbor we couldn't go into but uh, anyway uh, but the next great memory I have, and the most important uh, thing, um, uh, I guess, except for the fact that we had a, uh, we had in, a, in the middle of the med, we had a lot of vibrating, and one of the most courageous things I've ever seen, uh, to me at that time, a uh, guy do was our engineering engineering officer, uh, Don and OBA, and he went down under the ship, and took a look at the rudder and the shaft, for the propeller and found out what the problem was, and uh, he couldn't correct it, but uh, he knew that we could limp into port anyway. Okay. Uh, but having gone right under like that uh, in the middle of, you know, a huge sea. Um, but then, then uh, we had a huge air defense exercise with uh, simulated uh, enemy planes coming off uh, from France and uh, Spain and that type thing off Barcelona. And. Uh, I had, um, uh, we had been, the Benner was my ship. It was one of the f five destroyers uh, in the Navy at that time that were converted to uh, being radar picket ships. They were called DDR, and it was DDR 807. And that's the picture this guy right here. here. Okay. This is the ship I was on. I'm going to do the hold up again. You've seen my face, so we can get her. Oh. It's pretty heavy. Oh, I, well, I'm I'm a pretty strong guy. I was a CB. Oh I'm yeah, a CB. right. Well, I want to. We've wanna always talk been able that. to support the Navy. <laughs> but this was our ship, the Gearing class, and this is a watercolor. They had a guy came aboard the ship in Cannes, 
and is flying the Roger flag, which meant we were ready to receive. So I don't know whether uh, we were going in to fuel or if he was on a larger ship, which we were going to fuel from or what, but that means you're coming alongside a ship. And uh, that's called the Roger flag. And uh, of course, it had uh, twin inch, uh, five inch uh, uh, twin mounts, uh, five inch 38 mounts. And we had uh, a very fine uh, uh, air, uh, SPS-6 uh, air search antenna here. Uh, and also, uh, one of the, we had an extra tripod for altitude determination. So we, had, we were able to get the altitude aircraft, and that was why w there were only five destroyers in the fleet that had that second mast. Okay, so, can I put it down now? Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay, thanks. But uh, drop it, it. Uh, it was great. Uh, you know, they had a I great got... reputation, so I was only an ensign, and they highlined me to uh, the, the flagship of the Sixth Fleet was the USS Salem. And uh, that's where uh, uh, I uh, have a, sh a short clip, I think, that uh, we're going to possibly show. Brian, can you kick we that clue in now? Uh, which will show that one of my friends took me going across in the bosun's chair. Here we go. And I could probably talk a little bit yep. about it because it's silent as it's on. Okay. But you can spot it up here, I think. Oh, well, this just starts with Gibraltar, which uh, I, I'm not, not quite uh, to, uh, that was my, uh, when we first came into the Med, and I just wanted to show how impressive it was with, and oh, when we did, uh, we did go to uh, Pisa. Pisa, okay. And uh, had that, uh, when, when we were in Genoa, we went up to uh, Pisa, which was right nearby, and this was uh, some of the officers on board, and uh, you might oh. notice uh, some of us, uh, some of the, you know, I, I was taking the picture, but I mean, here's going up, you see how it's leaning. And they say it was, le you know, uh, a quarter of an inch every year or something for centuries. And uh, they, I hear, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, they stabilized it. But then we went to Florence, and this is one of the great cities in the world, and I filmed the river coming through Florent Florence, and, um, uh -huh. and I, I got a couple of um, shots of, uh, 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 that's a statue of David, which is one of the all-time classics by Michelangelo. And I don't, other great statues. Uh, and this, I was in my khakis on board ship, uh, regular working uniform. Here yeah. I'm being highlined. Okay. That's uh, going over to the Tell USS what's Salem. what's going on. That's uh, going to the USS Salem, which was a heavy cruiser. And uh, it, was a, it was exciting for me uh, going across underway. And I think you can see in a minute how the ocean is going through there. But um, the, uh, the, the only stateroom they could give me in Lowly Ensign was the commander was on leave. And so they gave me a commander's stateroom. And so, but we had, I had to observe this uh, huge air defense exercise. And I monitored a net to make sure that uh, the Controllers were, were all having uh, the right, um, that was uh, being oiled, uh, getting uh, fuel from an oiler. And this was uh, a three inch 50 mount, I think, that we had on board. And this is sending empty uh, shells back. That's well, our great bosun chief there. He always was right there with the men. And, and uh, so he, we all loved him. He had a great sense of humor, too. I think he came from around Boston. He had a Boston Irish sense of humor. But, uh, this just shows a little bit of the fueling operation. I think it'll show the uh, bring the, the hose, aboard, bring it, yeah. Bring, yeah, bringing the hose over. It. And there's the nozzle <laughs> coming over. And those things are. And heavy. here you can see, Bob. Uh, there's the twin ships are fueling on the other side yeah. of the order. There's another tin can on the on the other side getting fuel. So this is fellas uh, keeping the distance line so you don't get too close. The you know, have a tendency to waves to, oh, yeah. to try to bring it too close. So there's the bow of the, the oiler that uh, we got fuel from. But uh, anyway, we I th that's uh, this is the captain, and I can't remember his name. I think his name was Lockwood. He was a Naval Academy grad and a commander. And he was a very short guy. We call him Snuffy. <laughs> oh. I don't know. That was his nickname anyway. But I did, it was casual once in a while, and we're going back across the Atlantic, and this is a uh, uh, mine layer, a very small ship that, uh, and that I think is the end of the clip. But okay, there you go.
Uh, Thank you, Ryan. So, anyway, I didn't mean to. You know, we've got so much more to, to well, say. You but, may have uh, to edit it yourself. But, um, the, you know, uh, going back across, I got orders to fly. And by that time, I'd had two years active duty, and I had a situation, a conflict. I really did want to fly. Oh, you mean to go to, the, to, to Naval go, Air? To, to go to Naval I thought Air. thought you being transported. And finally got the, uh, finally got the uh, orders for, you know, Pensacola. And uh, I thought it over and I said, you know, I, I just, um, I have loved this uh, uh, experience and I felt so great with, on board with the team and the destroyer life, which was a lot of action. And, uh, um, and I was, that would mean that I'd have, you know, f four more years to go instead of like a year and a half left in my hitch. So, uh, so I, did, I had, as a voluntary thing, I just declined the orders. And right about that time, and I think it may have led in, it may have had a uh, part of my decision not to fly, was uh, the, we were told that there was a destroyer uh, named the Cogswell that was in Newport and needed a CIC officer. And they were about to go to the Pacific. Uh, would anybody be interested? And uh, I saw that and I said, uh, Great. I I saw that, and I, I said I I want to I'd I'd love to go to the Orient. I think it'd be a great experience. So, they they accepted me, and I went on. I transferred right in Newport from the Benner to the Cogswell, and the only I don't have a picture of the Cogswell, but I had a my brother Toki oh. was an artist, and he had cerebral palsy all his life. Another there uh, we go. Another another shot handicapped for you, Red. brother. Uh, he was a year older than me but he had a birth injury and he painted all his life, but he painted me with, as a JG, he, he looks more like a full lieutenant, but anyway, um, there's 651 and it was a, uh, it, it, it only had single mount, five inch 38 single mounts, and it had an older um, uh, air search, uh, it looked like a bed spring up there and Toki captured that all right, but, uh, it was a smaller th than the Gearing class, and I believe it was a Sumner class destroyer. But that's the one that we went down through I the got Panama Canal. I got it. And um, we stopped briefly in the in the in the canal for um, uh, a, a, an officer on board's father was commandant of the Panama Naval District, and I think his name was Miles. But we stopped and 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 the, had a chance to meet him. Or duty call. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're off to uh, San Diego, um, for which would be where we would go f on the way to, for you know our, uh, our final port before we went to uh, Westpac. But we had to make an emergency call in Acapulco, and that sounds you know going it right into that harbor was fabulous because the hills all around. But uh, we were only there long enough to know that um, that this was an emergency call. The a young Sailor's uh, family had been in a serious automobile accident coming across country to meet him in San Diego. So we, we just stayed long enough to know that he was all set and on the way to get a flight out and be able to join his family who were uh, oh, injured. So there was compassion then. Yeah. There was compassion. And uh, so, we, but when we knew he was on his way, so after Zip. three or four hours, we're gone. So there was no liberty or anything like that. Uh, but. Um, we're back to San Diego, and then we're on our way very soon um, in early January, but not uh, uh, until I had um, had uh, leave to go back to Massachusetts, and I ushered in my uh, younger sister Rosalie's um, wedding to uh, David McCullough, and so that was uh, that was uh, December of 1954. Is he the man and, from Uncle? And he's the man from uh, uh, David McCullough is the author. Uh, who won two Pulitzer Prizes and uh, wrote Truman and Path Between the Seas, which I thought I might be able to get a chance to talk about a little bit. Uh, but um, anyway, I, then I uh, went back um, to uh, San Diego. We're on our way to the Orient, and I, the first thing I remember is. Uh, Diamond Head suddenly popping yep. up out of the horizon. Great sight there. 
And uh, I had one, one great night there because a, a friend of mine from uh, Yale had told me to look up a guy and he lived on, uh, I, he, I called him in Hawaii, uh, in Honolulu, and he said, come on up. And uh, it's such and such an address, and I gave it to the taxi, and suddenly I'm up halfway up Diamond Head. And uh, so he, uh, he greeted, well, I was, he, he was a great affable guy, and uh, he was, uh, and his um, wife was the daughter of Anita Vanderbilt, but her maiden name was Howard, and uh, her father was, uh, um, uh, was the owner of uh, the great horse Seabiscuit. Oh, and, uh, you're traveling pretty good circles, man. Yeah, so anyway, uh, we had a great dinner at Trader Vic's, I think, in Honolulu, and uh, the only thing I can remember about it, they were very nice to me. We sat on a little island, and the waitress was named Rosalie, so I had a little talk about, you know, I have my sister's name is Rosalie. But uh, Anita turned to me one time, she said, yeah, I was in my whites, and, and, and the, she said, you know, you're, you're a nice looking young man, but she said, You're t you have terrible teeth. <laughs> so anyway, it hasn't changed a lot. I still have terrible teeth. But we, then we, they gave me a great book to read, which was Alexander Spektorsky's uh, Book of the Sea. And uh, so we're on the way, we're on the way to um, uh, Japan after that great uh, evening that I had with, with a delightful uh, family. And uh, we had to stop at Wake Island, where made famous by Truman and MacArthur later on, uh, or earlier rather, <laughs> meeting. And um, you know, uh, when he just before he fired MacArthur from uh, mm -hmm, yeah. the Korean situation. But uh, Wake Island is just memorable because it was a coral island with a rim. Of, you had to sort of ease in there to get by the coral, and we had to fuel there and. Uh, we went to have lunch in there. They had one, one or two buildings. And uh, the, the thing I remember mostly was seeing these goonie birds that paired off and they, oh, yeah. by pairs and they'd clack, clack, clack uh, their, their beaks against each other. And uh, then we went uh, from there to Sasebo. And I couldn't believe Sasebo, a great port in Japan. And we walked down the main street and it was a dirt road. I mean, you know, uh, they hadn't made much progress in those few years since the end of uh, World War II. But um, anyway, we we uh, we were there uh, briefly. We had a, a, a you know nice dinner there with the officers, and suddenly a shore patrol came and said, "Back to the ship, Every, all hands back to the ship," and we were off to uh, for 16 more days at sea, and we had to go to the Taishan Peninsula and get the help get the last uh, Chinese uh, nationalists uh, off the Chinese mainland uh, with Mao Zedong and, and the, you know, the Chinese communist forces. And they were uh, being pushed into the, right off, almost into the sea. And so we had this huge task force, LSTs and, and troop ships. And, uh, and our role was just to be a part of the screen, destroyer screen for the task formation. But we got, uh, you know, I don't know, there must have been hundreds of maybe thousand uh, people back uh, so that they were able to get to Formosa. Well, civilians and military personnel mixed? I think they were mostly military. I, I tell the truth, I never met any. I mean, we, we did, from there we went on to the Formosa patrol and our port was Kaohsiung, which was on the southern part of Formosa. And I just remember that you could smell Kaohsiung three miles out because, uh, you know, it, it didn't have the greatest uh, uh, sanitary, plumbing, uh, yeah. sanitary conditions. Night soil specialist. Yeah. But uh, it was an important role to play because we, uh, it was, uh, with the foremost patrol was um, plying up and down uh, right outside the Pescadores Islands, which were Quimoy and Matsu, and the Chinese communists were lobbing shells across. And, and my memory had that I c either I saw the flashes or heard the noise. We were close enough, you know. But uh, we, uh, we, it was, we, we were out of range of any shooting, so we weren't in any danger of being hit on board ship. But our important job was to uh, record all shipping that was going through the straits and especially looking for communist shipping and that type thing. So I was a, 
as a CIC type thing, uh, I was appointed the crypt cryptographic officer, so I had to send a secret message every night uh, back to the, um, it was the commander of the Seventh Fleet, uh, Vice Admiral Pride, who was uh, the one who had us uh, get, you know, to see uh, back in Sesamo. But from there, I think it went to Washington, but it was a secret message, and I, I would just type out in plain language what we had seen for the day that I'd gotten from the executive officer. And we had little five little wheels, which scrambled the whole thing in code of groups of five letters across the line. And uh, so, uh, anyway, that was, uh, uh, that was important uh, uh, function to do. And we also, we also trained the little uh, nationalist Navy guys who had like patrol boats that we had given them from the U.S. Navy. And I remember they were quite small, the officers we had up, and we were trying to teach them uh, some fleet maneuvering like uh, corpens and turns and uh, that type thing. But how to, you know, uh, maneuver uh, in uh, uh, formation. But uh, then from there, uh, we, um, we went to the Philippines and I remember uh, breaking off, making a high speed turn from the midway, which was schoolboy, that was their voice call. And I mean, our, our voice call was skim milk, by the way, and we used to, on that patrol, sometimes we get Chinese Okay. Uh, people on the net would come up uh, to communicate with me, and I would, as an air controller, I, I usually talk to whoever was up there in the air, and uh, they used to call us Scheme Milk. Scheme Milk, huh? Scheme Milk. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and what our voice, voice call of the banner back in the med was a spouse. But the midway was named Schoolboy, and you know, this was great, CBA number 41, and they had an unusual stack, a very uh, prominent part of their uh, superstructure. And we uh, broke off right off Corregidor, and I had the deck, and it was a high-speed turn, and we were off for somewhere. I think, actually, we went to Subic uh, Bay, which is a big, uh, one of the largest harbors uh, in the world, I think, um, uh, north of Manila. Mm -hmm. And I had a chance, uh, after we moored there, the executive officer said, uh, Sam, you got the weekend off. If you want to fly, there's a seaplane going over into Manila. Oh. And uh, so, uh, so I I hopped aboard the whaleboat and went over to the seaplane, and we were just over a hump, and then we were coming right in next to Clark Field there in Manila Harbor. But I remember the whole mass of sunken ships, and they must have been mostly Japanese ships, but uh, it was and quite World a War sight, II, yeah. quite a sight to see them that they hadn't been moved, you know, and uh, of course I hadn't said anything about. Uh, about uh, conditions of, um, you know, ha having come over uh, on the, in the Pacific, but we did hit a small typhoon, which was quite a quite an experience. But uh, anyway, w from there we went up, and uh, one of our last ports, I think, was Yokosuka, or Yokosuka, you know, they call it Yokosuka, right outside uh, near Tokyo. And uh, at at night, uh, they I had a chance to uh, to go to dinner. Uh, and I got a taxi, and, and I wanted to see Frank Lloyd Wright's, one of the great uh, monuments, or great things that he built. You know, he was America's greatest architect, really, in those days. And he, he had uh, designed the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. So I went there and just had dinner, but I, I got to see that massive uh, entryway with the great uh, port cashier, or, uh, you know, that uh, the uh, cars would come underneath and, and then you'd go right into this, uh, uh, and that was his style, was building, you know, massive mm, uh, buildings. Okay. And uh, so then uh, we're going back, uh, on the way back to, uh, and you asked about, you know, when we went back to the Pacific, uh, back, back You're gonna home, make it quick, Sam, we Diego. just got the flag for two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, I just want to say we, we weren't greeted, greeted with any parades or anything. We just greeted with families. And um, I, I, we had a new skipper come aboard who was off a submarine. And he was a great guy, but he needed, he needed our help in uh, learning the destroyer way, having been in a submarine career. And so uh, that was my last four or five months was with him, uh, helping him 
uh, be the good skipper that he became, I guess. Okay. And then I was on the way uh, off active duty. But then I had uh, something like um, uh, 18 more years of ready reserve, so I bracketed the whole Vietnam thing. And one of my great experiences as a reservist was flying with 250 Seabees, which you were, it was, and I respect the Seabees so much, uh, but they were the, uh, the Seabees that came from Pittsfield that spent a year over in Vietnam. And uh, so we took a bus down to, to um, uh, South Weymouth Naval Air Station in January, and I can remember thinking, hey, how is this thing going to get off the ground? I mean, <laughs> the snow was so high and so many guys on board with all the, looking like gyrenes, you know, with their greens and everything. And, uh, but we got it, and Gulfport was just rain, 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 but it was a great experience for me because I was the public affairs officer, and I was able to send, uh, I, I had, before it ended, I went to Boston, and I filed uh, stories for hometown newspapers all over New England. Okay. So uh, that was one of the, you know, one of the great experiences I had in the reserve, but I had so many others that well, we, I could As see. you saw, we just ran out of time, so yeah. right now we're on the cusp. But all I can say is I want to thank you for sharing with us, and maybe someday we can come back to chapter 2, 3, and 4. Well, okay. that would be great, Bob, if we, you would. I, I I'd will like try to do it, that. I want to make sure to get the guys. Now, uh, again, as strange as it sounds, when we first started, oh, what are we going to say for a whole 30 minutes? We're out of time right now, but again, when you come, be prepared to have a good time. Thank you again, and we'll see you soon. Have a good one.